but it is uh, good to be back. And Fred, thank you for the great music, and I appreciate so much your hospitality. And what a marvelous crowd for a Monday night. Uh, you're in a growing area, to say the least, in the way God is blessing. And I'm leading a national initiative. I'm on a tour that I'm already booked out three years, uh, crisscrossing America, and really just challenging with a simple who's your one in helping us to see that if every believer would just say, God, lay one soul upon my heart and love that soul through me, what a difference it would make. Whether it be a family member, uh, whether it be a neighbor, um, a work associate, a classmate. Uh, in Baptist life right now, we're at a low that reaches back seven decades, seven decades. So it's been 70 years since we've been this low. And if only 10% of the people that show up in our Baptist churches on a Sunday, which we average 5,297,000 and some change every Sunday, if only 10% of our people led one person to Christ in the next 12 years, we would not only double baptisms, but we would win more people to Jesus than any year since we became a denomination in 1845. And so uh, may God help you uh, here with 7 million people. In the city I live in, there's 5 million people. And so if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn with me in Mark chapter 2. And I want to speak on this subject. <clears throat> what happens when Jesus is in the house? What happens when Jesus is in the house. I love your pastor and I'm grateful to God for him and his family and for their encouragement uh, in my life. Uh, I really know he has a dream to make a significant difference in this church. Uh, we were talking before the church service and I simply said this. I said, when I wrote the sermon, I said to the young man that I'm mentoring, to take my place at Woodstock as I serve more on a national level. I said, I want you and your associate to listen carefully because what I'm going to preach today is what God used to build the First Baptist Church of Woodstock. So beginning in verse number one, the Bible says, and again, Jesus entered Capernaum after some days. And it was heard that he was in the house or noise that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their heart, why does this man speak blasphemous like this? Who can forgive sin but God only? Now I want to make a statement that I heard Robbie Zacharias make recently. When a person is saved, it is a moral decision more than an intellectual decision. If it was an intellectual decision, all of these scribes would have been saved because they're about to prove that Jesus is God. But it's a moral decision. It's a sin decision. Uh, the Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians 1.18 that a person really doesn't come to Christ through wisdom. For by grace are you saved through faith. You, you don't figure it out. No one's ever said, boy, I heard a sermon of the day and it makes sense. I want to be saved. No, it's a work of grace and it's the work of the Spirit of God and it's the power of the gospel. <clears throat> and the Bible says, but immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, 
your sins are forgiven you or to say arise take up your bed and walk but that you may know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins and don't pass by that listen to this the only place sin can be forgiven is on heaven in on earth every major religion outside of christianity has formulated a doctrine where you can be saved after earth uh, i just returned from preaching in india in hinduism uh, they have taught uh, reincarnation karma that basically you're going to be born again and maybe the next life will be better and through karma that you'll actually be elevated to a higher place of living. A Mormonism teaches proxy baptism that can move a person from a lower place toward hell to even a different place in heaven. Catholicism teaches that there's purgatory. The only religion that teaches it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment is Christianity. So, so hear me say this again. The son of man has power on earth to forgive sin. That's why there's an urgency. That's why we drive across country, fly across country, send emails, send texts to win people to Christ because they can only be forgiven while they're on earth. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins be forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. <clears throat> and he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that they were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Or my best translation says this, we never saw it on this fashion. So here's one thing that God does when Jesus is in the house. Church becomes like it's never been before. We, we, you'll be able to leave saying, how was church? We hate we missed, I'll get the tape. No, you can't get it on the tape because we've never seen it on this fashion. According to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 1, Capernaum was referred to as his own city. <clears throat> this city is located on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. I was there about 12 weeks ago. It's the headquarters of Jesus. You know the story. He was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, and set up his ministry headquarters in Capernaum. It was the hometown of Peter and his brother, Andrew. It was a city that knew much of the activity of the Lord Jesus firsthand experience. If you want to talk about a town of opportunity, Capernaum was it. However, according to the Bible, this city, for the most part, remained very unresponsive to the message of Jesus Christ. Now, there was such rejection that Matthew recorded Jesus' words of personal rebuke to Capernaum and neighboring towns in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 20. And let me just give you the gist of it. He said, Capernaum, you have been exalted to the heavens. He said, but if the work that were done in your midst had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would still remain. He said, even though you've been exalted to heaven, you will be brought down to hell. It's amazing. So the text causes me to beg the question, when he works in our midst, do we still question his power and authority to do mighty things? So if you've got a pencil, pen, lipstick, or mascara, I want to give you some statements. So here's the question, and I'm just going to walk through probably about four thoughts. What happens when Jesus is in the house? Number one, and listen to this, this is so important. The word is preached. The word is preached. Now, the word is preached because of drawing power. The Bible says it was noised abroad that he was in the house. It was Jesus was back. He had been there in the past and 
His return drew the crowd. The greatest thing that can happen in any church is for word to get out, Jesus Christ is in the house. There's a drawing power. Jesus said himself in Matthew 12, 32, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Now, this small Palestinian home, uh, Simon Peter's house, we believe, a one room structure with a flat roof, is a home that was so crowded, nobody else could get in it because Jesus was in the house. But there was not just drawing power, there was dynamic preaching. Uh, verse two says, he preached the word to them. Uh, two words there are very significant. Number one, he uses a little word, laleo, which means preach. And it means in a conversational tone, in a simple down to earth, easy to understand language, he was feeding them the word of God. You know, you have favorite verses in the Bible, favorite phrases. One of my favorite is Mark 12, 37. The common people heard him gladly. Uh, the Bible says the rich and the poor have this in common. God made them both. He's the creator. And so they, they were common people. Common people listen to Jesus. And personally, I believe everybody I've ever preached to it's just a common man or a common woman. Some have done better than others. There's a lot of wealth in Houston. But a lot of the people that are well-to-do started just like everybody else. And the bottom line is, sometimes we think we become too sophisticated to hear a message that the common man heard gladly. When Jesus preached, I wrote these four things down. Number one, he drew a crowd. Uh, crowds come when they get word that Jesus is in the house. Uh, when I went to Woodstock, we had such a bad reputation. Somebody called me this week and said, can you help me? My church has a bad reputation. What would you do? And I said, our church had a bad reputation. We began to really grow. Went across the street. Morgan's Hardware was not open on Sunday. I said, can I use your parking lot on Sunday? He said, absolutely not. I'll do nothing for that church. Just had an awful reputation. I would go visiting and I would say, I'm from Woodstock, and my wife and I wanted to visit with you. We talked to them and said, I'd like to invite you to visit with us. Here's what they'd say. We've already been. And so I bought the name, bought the domain that says, it's a new day. I own that. It's a new day. And so we put it on the marquee. It's a new day. And so you need to come. It's a new day around here. And when it was a new day in Jesus was in the house, it really drew a crowd. Um, from one service to three, from every Bible study class being full to renting 19 off-campus sites. And I'll give you another word in a moment. Number two, it drew people of confidence. People came to church, listen to this, and brought people with them because they were confident if they could just get them to Jesus. I'm, I'm just going to be honest. My observation is, and, and my research proved this true recently. We've moved into a generation where people are coming to church alone. We don't bring folks with us. That's why we're so pumped about friend day and hearing people talk about they're bringing somebody with them. People don't bring people to church with them. And so there was a day when people brought people. I'm a Christian. Because N.W. Pridgen kept saying, you and Janet come to church with me. I did a survey in my own church and found out over 90% of our people came to faith in Jesus Christ because somebody invited them to church. And then we have the audacity to criticize. I'm an evangelist at heart. I share the gospel all the time. But yet I plead with people to come. Hardly ever is there a Sunday that somebody's not seated with me down front that we work with during the invitation and plead with them to come to faith in Christ. He drew a crowd. He drew people of confidence. He drew the crippled. Jesus always drew the marginalized. When you will minister to everybody in your community and reach every kind of people. There's one thing you don't know about me. Normally people say, well, he's got a tan. He stays out in the sun a lot. No, I'm an American Indian for heaven's sake. I'm dark. 
I'm a lumbee. So what's a lumbee? Well, it's the derivative of the Cherokee. In 1515, the Spaniards married the Cherokee in eastern North Carolina, and we're lumbee. So give me the skinny of that. I'm a half-breed. <laughs> matter of fact, I've, I've done the DNA, and I've got all sorts of stuff. I've been saying to churches for 25 years, the day that anyone is not welcome where I preach, I leave with them because I'm probably one of them. And so it makes a difference. And so he drew the cripple. He always dealt with a merchant. But listen to this. Don't, don't miss this. This is in the book. He drew criticism. Anytime you preach the word and God begins to really move and you start pushing back darkness, the enemy comes. So we use the first word he preached, but then it says he preached the word. <clears throat> Last thing I want to do is try to impress someone with my theological education. But there's some words that the church knows. The church knows agape, the, the, the God, God's love, unconditional. Uh, most people, if for no other reason, because of a, a system for your computer, they know logos which is the word. But the word he uses here when it says he preached the word, he uses the word logon. Why would you go to such instances to tell us that? It's a word that's used of the message of salvation. It is the word for the gospel. So listen carefully. When Jesus got a crowd together, he preached the gospel. He gave them the gospel. When our church began to explode, you know what some people would say? That's a good place to go and get saved, but you really can't grow there. And uh, it always blessed me. So I guess that's what they say about Jesus. Went down to hear Jesus today and he just preached the gospel. And so he preached the gospel. It, the first Corinthians 15, one through four. And just for the record's sake, he says, I deliver to you first of all, and one translation of the Greek says, I delivered you to you first of importance. Now, let me just be quick to say this, because I really believe that uh, with the leadership you have, um, you could really in the next few years just explode. I mean, you really could. I mean, it's, I mean, Lord Jesus is a thousand people here to seven million in your city. And so basically, uh, there's a lot of things that are important. They really are. There's a lot of things that are important. I, I love music. What a great singer. Great music. But it's not first importance. Right. Sorry, Joseph. I love you. <laughs> love me music. I'll just be honest under God. I love the Perrys. I, gosh, I love y'all's group. Uh, I'm grateful for Bible study. I'm grateful for whatever you do in missions. We've sent 130 missionaries. Our last, I just returned from Morocco. I was just teaching three months ago in Hanoi, Vietnam. So I have a heart for missions. I planted 130 churches. I planted the fastest growing church in Las Vegas. I mean, so I've been out there. I've been around. I love ministry. But nothing is more important than us sharing the gospel. Nothing. Nothing's more important than the gospel. So when Jesus is in the house, number one, the word was preached. Number two, faith was persistent. Uh, this is a passage of determination. Um, so great was their love for the sick man and their faith in the power of Jesus to heal him that they would not take no for an answer. They, they were committed to going to any length to bring anyone with their problems to Jesus and ask Jesus to deal with them. I'll tell you what you hear. When faith is persistent, listen carefully, faith will speak. And so I, I wrote down, I'm just going to give them to you quickly, but listen to, this, listen to these six things I wrote about what faith says. Faith says there's always many who will never reach Jesus unless somebody takes them. Um, just tell you what I do. I uh, take my phone I've, in the back of my Bible because of this who's your one. And if it got anybody's attention, just make a note of who's your one dot com. And you go there and you'll download a card like this. And it just says, who's your one. And I've got Percy written there and uh, Percy's the bus driver for um, my, my children in winter jam. 
And so I've really been after him, gave him the gospel, got him to church the other day. I text him all through the week. He told my daughter today, he said, I don't know what it is about your daddy, but the man acts like he loves me. He doesn't really hardly know me, but I want to love him to Christ. Um, uh, I text, she, she's flying back to her hometown of China, but Grace is my wife's one. And, and we have a busy life. I bet you have a busy life. And so uh, we need to get the gospel to her and her husband. And we're trying to think, when can we work it in? And so I, I, uh, I write a good bit and I journal. And so when I journal, I write thoughts. Don't you listen to this thought. The longer I am part of his kingdom, the further removed I am from those he died for. Now let it settle in. I'm going to say it again. The longer I'm part of his kingdom, the further removed I am from those he died. When I got saved, everybody I knew was lost. And they say, you got any lost friends? I think yeah, everybody. In fact, I used to console myself about going to hell because hell couldn't be too bad. Everybody I knew was going to hell. Everybody I liked was going to hell because I didn't know anybody in the church. Think about that. But then I've been in church and I can show you my schedule for tomorrow. Everybody wants to see me as another believer and I love that. But when do I intentionally have time to preach the gospel? We can be so busy at church that we can't work the lost people in. And, and just, this is a bold statement, but I'm going to make them now. And then Brother Jerry can quote me. And if you don't like it, you can just say, I still disagree with Pastor Hunt. And, and give him a break. You exist for those who don't belong. Charles Stanley's a good friend. He's getting ready to turn 87. And uh, there's reasons that we're close. But the bottom line is he uh, was talking to me recently. He said this. He said, John, have you ever thought about this? If God saved you for heaven, he would have been better off to kill you and take you there today he saved you. But he saved you to bring him glory by making the gospel known. Just, um, that's, that's good, Dr. Stanley. So um, there's always many that will never be reached unless somebody brings them to Jesus. So here's how we do it. I'm just, just be honest. Hey, Grace, um, Janet and I want to know if you'll meet us tomorrow in our third service at 11 o'clock. I'll save you a seat down front, and we want to take you to Tuscany to eat lunch after the service. I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, 99% of the time, that'll get somebody there. Don't, we don't just say, I'd like for you to come sometime. Sometime it's no time. We intentionally, we, can you come Sunday, sit with us on the front row, and then I preach the gospel, we're praying the spirit of God work in her life, and then I watch my wife down there working with her during the invitation, pleading with her to come to faith in Christ. And, Sam, and I'm just talking, these are the ones we're after right now. Number two, if this is good, if there were more bringing believers, there would be more saved sinners. Uh, number three, they had faith to believe Jesus would meet his need. Uh, my dad checked out on my mom when I was seven. My mother raised six children in a government project. I stayed in and out of trouble law. I'm ashamed of it. I managed to pool room for four years. When I was 16 years old, I quit school. No purpose direction in life. I resented my dad. He had been married two or three times at least then. Only God knows before he died how many times he was married. I've got so many siblings. And honest before God, not try to be melodramatic, I only know all of them. But when I got saved, here's what I thought. I was heading down the same road. I could have become just like my dad, Norman Hunt Jr., without Jesus. And God broke my heart for my dad. And I thought, you know what? It's pretty simple. My dad just needs Jesus. I mean, with Jesus Christ ruling and reigning in his heart, so they had faith to believe that Jesus would meet their need. And so you know what I did? I drove to Pikeville, Kentucky, from Wilmington, North Carolina, around 10 hours. And I didn't know what to say. I was a newer believer. And by the way, you don't have to have resources to witness. You have to have a broken heart and a passion to witness. A lot of people have been trained that never share the gospel. 
So, so I just went, and so I'm, I'm going to witness to my daddy. I'd asked Bido to pray, and I'm a new believer, and I went, and I said, Dad, I didn't know what to say. So the Bible says, this is good. The Holy Spirit of God will give you the words to say in the hour you need them. So I walked in. I looked at Dad, and I said, Dad, I got a new father. He said, did Bessie get married again? <laughs> and then I didn't know what I was saying, and here's what I said. No, sir, I got saved. And somebody said, what did you say beyond that? I didn't know anything else. I just shared what I knew. And then I said, but dad, I brought you a gift. He said, you did, son? I said, I did. And we'd not seen each other in 13 years. And so I, I, I had a rug made, had a rug maker in my church. So I made a rug and I can still see it. It's white and orange and I'm not a Tennessee volunteer. But anyway, I had this rug. And on the rug, I put Acts 16.31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in the house. I said, Dad, every day when you leave, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God get you to look down, see the rug and the promise. And when you clean your feet when you come in. And I know somebody can say, this, is, this sounds like you're stretching it. But I'm, I call the Spirit of God as my witness. I only remember my dad ever calling me one time in my life. One time in my life. He called me. And said, boy, I thought you'd want to know. I went to church this morning and got saved. And I'm being baptized next Sunday. And I've got a picture of his baptism. And I, I preached my dad's funeral and got to talk to him and become pretty good friends with him in those latter days. Uh, number four, they put feet to their prayer. Uh, number five, they did not permit the difficult circumstances to discourage them. I drove 10 hours. Uh, number six, they worked together and dared to do something different. Therefore, they dug up the compact, thatched roof. And I know they were not bad. Had they been Baptists and they got there and said, well, it's full. We'll have to come back some other time. But instead, these dudes are willing to, to climb on top of the thatched roof. Uh, there's another word. Wait a minute. Hold on. Because I was asked tonight, Pastor, think of some things you'd share with us. And I said, well, good night. I can't believe it. This is what I'm preaching tonight. Not only did I come up and buy the domain, it's a new day. And now that's what our ministry is named, our tape ministry. But I put another word up there. Whatever it takes. So I'm talking 33 years ago, whatever it takes. What do you mean whatever it takes? Here it is. The day that God puts such a demand on the church to reach more people that we would say, not there, that's too much. That's the end of your growth. That's how much you grow. But if you'll say, God, whatever it takes, we're going to trust God. And it's not just sing. Wait a minute, because we're getting it right in our music. We sing about how great he is. And sometimes the very hands that are raised in praise to his greatness are the same hands that go up in the business conference. You know, I can't believe I'm doing what I'm doing tonight. You know what I'm thinking? I got a call a couple of days ago. Bill Stafford, Sue called, and Bill Jr. and said, Johnny, we just want to serve notice, uh, Dad, any day now, any day, and we want you to preach the funeral. Say, so why did you even bring that up? Well, first of all, because I've got ADD and I can surf and jump and move everywhere. I've got, like, a, my mind's like a transistor radio. I've got thoughts coming from everywhere, and I'm trying to decipher which ones am I going to share. Because Bill Stafford came to Woodstock 33 years ago and said, you shout amen now, but wait until you need. And um, I don't even want to tell you. Well, I will tell you. The last building we built was $65 million. And we'll be debt free in 12 months on a hundred million dollar campus. It's cost the count to reach. He can, we can talk about they have thousands and thousands on Sunday. And we're sending missionaries and we're planning churches. Oswald Chambers said, give me a man or a woman that will be sold out to God and it'll cost everybody a lot that's close to them. So this is one of the greatest Bible stories of whatever it takes. Number three, quickly. Um, forgiveness is present. The word is preached, faith is persistent, but forgiveness is present. Now, um, Joseph sang some great songs with great lyrics. And they really ministered, I could tell. 
So I tried to just write something and it's not profound, but just to remind me of something. So listen to this. I wrote, forgiveness is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed. It meets the greatest need. It costs the greatest price. It brings the greatest blessing. And it has the most lasting results. I mean, you think about that. When I got forgiven 46 years ago, and, and some people don't understand this, and, and, and I'm just going to have to give you a, a pass. If you don't understand, I just say get into a good Sunday school class and they'll help you to understand it. I am so forgiven, I couldn't go to hell if I wanted to. <laughs> a lot of people don't understand that. I'm telling you. I mean, the Bible says I'm saved to the uttermost. Nothing can snatch me out of his hands. What can separate me from the love of God? When I found out I had cancer 10 years ago, my wife fell over in the chair. You'd have to know her. She's prophet strong. Oh my God, that woman is strong. I'd never seen that side of her. And, she, and, and I, I was kind of prepared in the back of my mind when the doctor said, after another exam, he said, I want you to come to my office. And we're personal friends. And I thought, I've never been to his office before. This is not good. And then he dropped the word. And when he dropped the C word, the way Janet was sitting on the edge of her seat, she fell. She, she was a little ticked off on the way home. And this is not like her. I can't even believe I even tell this story. Here's what she said. I said, hey, you seem to be really disturbed. Are you okay? She said, I'm not okay. And um, I'm going to have a talk with God about this. And I thought, well, well what's, what about what? She said, um, it's not fair. And, and I, I take this the right way. I'm telling you what she said. Some of my, I've already met two of our families from Woodstock that have moved here. She said, I, I don't know of anybody that travels as much as you do. She said, you have preached the gospel all over the world. You're constantly going. Um, and I still am. And, and, and I don't know what all I want to say to you, but I came out of poverty and I never thought I'd have anything. So stay with me. Because if, if you're going to build a work, if you want God, stay with me. If you want God to build a work upon which the sun never sets, it's going to cost. And, and so I, I became a generous giver. I've got seven life goals before I die. And I'll just tell you this. One of them's modeling generosity. So I, I really, um, somebody asked me today, he said, uh, a guy wrote me, I can't believe it. He said, you don't know me. Somebody gave you your email. He said, but, uh, I offended a waitress and I feel bad about it. And I've always heard how you're a generous giver because your mother was a waitress. And he said, I feel that I'm supposed to go back and ask her to forgive me and lay a hundred dollars down and walk out. He said, do you think God would say that? And I said, it would have to be God because you're a tight wad. You'd never conjure up an idea like that. <laughs> if you ever are, are challenged in your spirit to do something sacrificial, you can rest assured it is almighty God because you would never come up with that idea. <laughs> you know, I, um, I don't know why I'm feeling so much at home here. I hadn't been in so long, but, uh, but we do, we, we really, sometimes people say, I'll tell you what I'm going to do at the new year. Well, I'm going to just tell you what we do. We say, God, help us to touch more and give more away than ever. See the man who paid for my college and uh, paid for my books and bought my clothes and all. See, I was in poverty, I was in poverty, welfare, and you can't get into college with grants and scholarships when you got a GED and it took me three attempts to get the GED. So a man, a man came to my house one day and I'm pastoring a church and I'm only there for one semester at the school because the president said, I'm going to work it out for you to get in for one semester. And then if no money comes and it was a non-state supported school because it was a Christian school said, you'll have to leave. But who, who would have known that God, I wish I had time to give you the miracle of this, called me to pat three years after I was saved. I was pastor of my first church. And when I got saved, I'd never held a Bible in my hand, never owned a Bible until the day after I was saved. And now I'm pastoring. In three years, I'm pastoring my first church. God pushed me in the deep end. 
So, so after, after six months, I'm through with school. I don't have any money. Mother's on welfare. Dad's in other marriages. That's out there before he came to Christ. And my in-laws were not Christians. Later, I led my mother-in-law and father-in-law to the Lord. The way I know I'm a Christian, led my mother-in-law to the Lord. But anyway, uh, I just thought it's that. And I'm, I'm in the same boat you're in. Uh, my mother-in-law was one of the most precious women in the whole world. But I just wanted to see if you were still listening. So here it is. Got to tell it quick. So a man and woman comes to my house. Otis and Viola Scruggs. She preferred to go by the name Punk, Punk and Otis. They came to our house and they said, we began to talk and they said, uh, we have two boys. And I said, God, I know I've only been here a couple of months, but I thought I knew you pretty good. I didn't know you had kids. They said they're both in heaven. Both died before they were two. And then I heard a story. I've never heard anything like it. We used to kneel by their bassinets and pray that one, if not both, would become preachers. And they both died. I said, here we are now. We're in our late 70s. And the only aspiration of our soul was never answered. We wanted to. We wanted to parent a pastor. I said, good night. That is the greatest story. I am so sorry. And then listen to this. That's where you come in, Pastor Johnny. I said, what do you mean? They said, we're here. We want to adopt you. I'm 23 years old. And I said, what do you mean you want to adopt me? I had, listen to this, I'm a pastor. I wish you'd gone to my library. In my library, I had a Schofield reference, King James, can I get a witness? <laughs> I, had, I had a Matthew Henry commentary of the Bible and two red books by Warren Beers, Wearsby, Calvary Book Room. That was my library. I had one suit. So, you know, you change it up. You know, you take the pants and wear it with a different shirt and tie. You, you know what I mean? Change that thing any way you could. He said, um, here's what I mean. Son, I want to pay for all your education. I want to buy you clothes, Miss Janet clothes, and Holly and Deanna. And I want you to come and see me every two weeks. And just come shake my hand, son. That's all you need to do. And um, I'm going to have something in there to bless you with. And he talked about several other things he wanted to do. And I was just sitting there stunned. And he said, well, how about it? I said, hello, dad. <laughs> right. I, um, I've written one book on leadership. I just signed a contract to write another one. And I, I'm going to write about this statement. I said to him before he died, I said, I just have never had anybody be so generous to me. And I don't know how to thank you. Thank you. And listen to the words he said. Listen to his words. Pastor Johnny, I've never missed anything I've given away. You can have bad investments. You can waste, spend, never miss anything I gave away. So um, he influenced me, influenced. So I wrote five questions. I hope to get back to my sermon. I'll close with an illustration. But I wrote five questions. So, so I want you to answer them. In your soul, answer them. Who influenced you? When did they influence you? Why did they influence you? How did they influence you? And here's the question that will make a difference whether your life will count or not. And if you're still breathing, it's not too late to count. But you can't make a difference without answering the fifth question. What have you done with the influence? I could tell you what Otis did for me, but if it influenced me, it means it changed me. And then you become like the one who influences you. I can't remember, I can't remember when Janet and I have it supported, including right now, a college or a seminary student and paid their way. Last year, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I'm just going to have to trust that my heart's conveying the truth of God. Last year, we gave all of our income back to Woodstock. Somebody says, why? Because we could. I said, well, you must just really be rich. Oh, yeah, typical preacher, rich. <laughs> I've been forgiven. 
one other quote on this, and I'll try to get into it. Forgiveness. What a blessed word for a sin-hardened soul. Debts discharged. Guilt's gone. Conscience clean. Past pardon. That's why you can tell your story. Your conscience has been clean. Your past is pardoned. Your, your record's removed. Number four, and I'll just give you this one and I'll close with it. Doubt is on the prowl. Uh, or picture this. One of the uh, statements, how did I write that? Uh, Jesus is about to make two statements. One of the statements is invisible in its demonstration. Say, so what, what if I just did this? Somebody came forward tonight and I stood beside him and said, uh, Hey man, thanks for coming to Jesus tonight. Well, brother, I just want you to know. Your sins are forgiven you. That's invisible. You can't tell that. When somebody makes a decision, like if you're a pagan, a hellion, and you get saved, and you go back to the hellions and say, uh, I got saved. Somebody says, they didn't respond. They don't have to. Here's, they did respond, but you didn't hear it. Listen to the response. We'll see. <laughs> and if you got saved, they will see. And if you didn't get saved... And then he said, uh, take up your bed and walk. And then Jesus said, which is easier? And the reason he asked that is they said, uh, only God can forgive sin. So stay with me on the intellectual part of salvation. Here's these scribes, there's teachers of the law. They're very intelligent. They believe only God can forgive sin. They believe that sin and suffering are interchangeably, unmistakably, Combined. The, the, the reason he's in that condition is because of his sin. Uh, let, me, let me quote a rabbi. Uh, rabbis uh, would, would make statements uh, that sin and suffering were intricately connected. And they argued that if a man was suffering, he must have sinned. Listen to the Jews of the Old Testament. Eliphaz to Job. Job chapter 4 verse 7. Remember now, whoever perished being innocent. Or where were the upright ever cut off? Rabbi, there's no sick man healed of his sickness until all of his sins have been forgiven. The only way a man that is lame can be healed is first he must be forgiven because they're intricately connected. So Jesus said, well, what is easier to say? Your sins forgiven, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know the son of man has power, here it is, on earth to forgive sins. Take up your bed and walk. And bottom line, he did. You know, matter of fact, I, I think I have a sanctified imagination. I think he did the jig. Did you know there's a path, a path from earth to heaven? Um, Chris knows we're dealing with it. A man painted at my house last week. I visited with him. I've been gone eight days. I'm on my way home uh, tomorrow morning, Lord willing. So last Monday, I was at CVS on Memorial Day getting some last minute things for our family before we did a little outing. And then I had to head to Palm Springs to teach. While I was there, I ran into Eddie. Eddie, Eddie's a painter. He's a wonderful believer. He really is. He's always got a smile on his face. A real, a common man like myself. Uh, we visited just a little bit. Good to see you, Eddie. So I'm starting at your house tomorrow. So I called my wife. I said, honey, did Eddie work this week? She said, honey, he worked all day, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday painting. And then Friday, he went to Tennessee to see his granddaughter play play ball. He's 60. He had a massive heart attack and died. So, so here's all I'm saying. I want, you, I want you to take this with you. Listen to this. Um, his wife, I've got it in my phone. His wife Sharon, she texts me. They wanted me to do the funeral. And he's not a member of our church, but she, she said, if everybody ever painted for you, just, he loved you and loves your kids. We, we love daddy. But here's what she said. Um, 
pray for the family is tough, but we know that Eddie's with the Lord. Uh, to be absent from body, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. It's to be present with the Lord. So here, here's my point. There's a path that leads from earth to heaven. Now, I really believe with all of my heart that when I die, I instantaneously go to heaven. Right, hold on. There's a path also that leads from earth to hell. In fact, based on the authority of scripture, when a person dies, please hear me. And I'm going to quote Jesus. And a lot of times people think, you know, I went to hear this old boy and he was a hellfire brimstone preacher. You better be careful and, and instead, and, unless that's what you think of Jesus. Because Jesus spoke of hell three times every time he spoke of heaven. The Bible says, and the man died, the rich man died, Luke 16, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. And being in torment, and guess what he prayed for? That somebody would send somebody by his house because he's got five brothers. Let me ask you a question. It's, it's, this is convicting to me too. If a man in hell is burdened over five people, can you name five? So, so, you, so really, here's what you, you know what caused me to go witness to my daddy and eventually dad came to Christ. I was reading, I read my Bible every day, every day, a good portion of it. So listen to this. I read that portion where Jesus said, he that believeth not in me is condemned already. And see, sometimes you can think, you know, if mom and daddy don't get saved, one day they'll be condemned. No, you, you got it wrong. They're already condemned. The word condemned is a word that really means to cut loose. It means they're already cut loose. They have no relationship with God. They're drifting in the moment they die. They go straight to hell. That's what it really means. All right, but then quickly, let me do this. No, I'll quit. There's a road, a path that leads from earth to heaven. You're, some of everybody in this room's lost somebody, and you can say they're with the Lord because you, you believe that path. Some of you, I hope you're not always hoping against hope. You've lost friends and family that went to hell, but there is no path from hell to heaven. Jesus, Luke sixteen twenty six. There's a great gulf that separates heaven from hell. That those that would desire to go from here to there cannot, and vice versa. Uh, there's no path from heaven to hell, and no path from hell to heaven. So really, it's, it's final. It's really death. Death is final. So, so that's why somebody says, why, why does he holler? Why does he, why does veins pop in his face? Why does he sweat? Uh, why the urgency? I, um. I was preaching at First Baptist Church, Indian Trail. Y'all been there a ton of times. Three weeks ago. Um, I told my secretary knows to tell him this, and somehow they we got it mixed up. But I always say, put me to the airport because I take these godforsaken early flights. So I had a 6 a.m. flight, and I was 25 miles, and they had no shuttle. So I told Mike Whitson, Mike, I'm going to take Uber. And he sang all four stanzas of what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> so I get up the next morning. I'm closing. This is it. I'm trying to close. This is it. I got up the next morning at 425. Uber picked me up. And her name was May Linda. How do you forget that name? May Linda. And this is really funny. She was wound tight. I don't know if she had had a lot of caffeine, had been up all night, but she was letting it rip. I mean, good night. And, and I, there was a part of me when I first got in the car, I thought, good night. I wish she'd hush. And, and then uh, I, I've been known, they say that if you're going to be a preacher and go to distance, you got to have a sense of humor. So I began to get tickled. And here's what I thought. I thought to myself. 
I know why she's talking so much. Scientifically, it's been proved that every day women use twice as many words as men. <laughs> and I was thinking, she flat getting ahead of us right now this morning. And I told my wife this, you know, she said, that is not it at all. You know why we use twice as many words? I have to tell you everything twice. I resemble that remark. So here's what I did. So I want you to hear me. Please hear me. I said, you know what? If we're going to talk, I'm going to turn this into a gospel conversation. So I said, I finally got a word in. I said, hey, May Linda, do you go to church anywhere? And by the way, look at me for just a moment. That was as easy as saying, how about the Braves? You know, I know football season is back. I'm not a sports fan. I just, what I know is from hearing y'all, good night. Everybody was talking about you. I was in Dallas preaching uh, last night. Oh, Lord. <laughs> One preacher got up to preach, and I thought he was going to give an invitation to become a cowboy. That's honest to God's truth. Am I telling the truth, Chris? I thought, is he ever going to talk about Jesus instead of the Cowboys? And, but, and, and Chris said, Pastor, I am a sports fan. Don't say anything negative while you're in Dallas about the Cowboys. We'll never be invited back. So, so, any, so anyway, uh, really where I'm trying to get, I'm getting my points coming across. I'm telling you, look at me, you men and women. You talk to your neighbors about everything but Jesus. So I said, um. She said, uh, thank you for asking. Most of my life I've gone to the Catholic church, but in recent days, and my kids love it, we're going to the Christian church. I said, that's good, May Linda. So she went on and telling me what she likes about it. And then again, listen, gospel conversation. Can I ask you another question? Sure, sure. When you were attending the Catholic church or the Christian church, did you ever repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus? Look, she's driving. <laughs> oh my God. What a question. And then I said, uh, Hey, May Linda, can I tell you why I ask? Sure. Listen to this. May Linda, I believe everybody lives forever somewhere. I said, matter of fact, listen to this. I believe everybody, are y'all listening? Everybody that's ever lived is still alive. Somewhere. How does she respond, Pastor Johnny? Tell us the truth under God. No exaggeration. Sir, I believe that. So now we're pulling up to the airport. And I said, I'm, I'm going to give you a nice tip. And I wish I had time to tell you because single mom worked in the factory in daytime and she worked as a waitress at night. So I, uh, I don't tip predicated on service. Pharisees can do that. I give a good tip if it's awful service. And my mindset is this might be my mama with six kids at home and she want to be here. She got abandoned. So I flat give them a good tip. I mean, I just, so I tip based on my relationship with Jesus, not predicated on the service rendered. So I gave her, I really gave her a big tip, more than the ride. And I said, but can I ask you one more question? And she said, another one? I said, yes, ma'am. And I said this, I said, um, and, and I'm going to pray for you. I want to pray for you before I get out of the car. She said, all right. Hey, Melinda, um, suppose you were to die today and you were to stand before God and he would ask you, uh, why shall I let you to my heaven? What do you think you'd tell her? Oh, God, I don't, I don't really know. And I said, well, I want you to think about that, and I'm going to pray with you. And um, first time I'd ever witnessed to her. I gave her a good tip. Got inside, and I got the app, you know, because you can get the tip on the app. I tipped her on the app, too. <laughs> I, I just, when you start sharing the gospel, you get in a generous mood. <laughs> you do. And, uh, but I, uh, what, what are you trying to say, preacher? I'm just trying to tell you that the greatest need your neighbors have, the greatest need your family has, and I don't know why I want to say this. I've been saying it everywhere I go. 
Some of you have got children, and here's what you say. I don't know what's going wrong with them, Brother Johnny. They came to church when they were children. Can I ask you a question? Did they have an option? And then when they got out of the house, they lived like hell. For, they ain't been in church in 20 years. I'm getting ready to leave town, all right? So we we'll take this with you. They made decisions, but they never became disciples. And if that is not true, God is a respecter of persons because God put something in my heart and it's a love of God that will not let me go. My Bible says that I can't continue in sin. God will chasten me and even, even, even take my life prematurely to take me home if I continue to disgrace his name. He said all of his children are chastened by him. Discipline. When a, when a person lives 20 years, like there's no God and there's no conviction, there's no Christ. And listen to me carefully. You ought to take this home with you. No change, no Christ. Why would you say that, preacher? Because you need to quit praying they'd come back and you need to start praying they'd get saved. When you become a disciple, the seed, stay with me. I, this is theology. The seed of God is planted in you and it reproduces itself. But you can make a decision and nothing is planted in you. And it ultimately shows they went out from us because they were not of us. No change, no Christ. We say, I think it's unfair for you to say that. I think it's unfair for you to think somebody that's been a rebel for 20 years with no resemblance to God's son. I wrote 12 sermons, 12 sermons on what is a disciple. And I find nothing in my Bible that would describe somebody in years, decades of rebellion. When he was six years old, he got baptized. Any man in Christ is a new creation. God didn't give you all of it and give them a little dab. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for our time together. Work deep in our heart. Thank you for what you have done in this church. Good night. What a strong fellowship. But yet to think what an army these precious people are and could continue to be to reach really thousands of neighbors. All these people that are already here, 200,000, and all those that are coming, God, give them a whatever it takes mentality. Help them to have the tenacity of the four men that are willing to tear the roof off to get someone to Jesus. Help us to be confident in the one we represent. And Father, help us to take our prayer to a new level for those that we think are just wayward when the truth is they may literally be perishing from all likelihood they're perishing. So God, speak mightily and use us. With heads bowed and eyes closed, in a moment we're gonna sing an invitation hymn and we're not gonna drag it out We've been here almost two hours. God may be speaking to your heart. Could very well be in this room. It's a man or a woman, a young person to say, I've, I've never been changed. Uh, I, I don't have the calm assurance that if, like your friend Eddie, the painter, if, if I had a massive coronary or if my other friend that died in the Ukraine early this morning, uh, that if that happens suddenly, that you know you would be with the Lord. If not, I pray the night you'd come to Jesus. I pray that God would break your heart for your one to start with one. Soon you'll win that one and you'll replace them. But who is the one? Are, are we even concerned? Is it on our radar? It's like unreached people groups around us. And, and we need to be like missionaries to say, God, we're going after them. So God grant it. Uh, remind us there's a path to heaven, a path to hell, but no path from hell to heaven. And, and that you have power on earth to forgive sin, power on earth. So God grant it. Maybe your vision believes the church God have you to be a part of. You've moved everything here but your membership. 
And I would encourage you to come and serve Christ. Other area God's calling, I just encourage you to respond. Let's stand in prayer all over. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for our time together. I pray you would uh, speak deeply and mightily into our life. Draw us to yourself, uh, and we wait before you. In Jesus' name, amen. God is speaking. I encourage you to come. No need for us to linger. We ought to just respond. Come now.